Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Cannabis Review. I'm delighted to be joined by a financial powerhouse in the industry, Rob Seacrest, who's the co-founder and president of Polaris Equity Group. How are you keeping today, Rob? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for joining us. I know you're a very busy man, so we'll keep this as brief as we possibly can. I just want to give the audience an overview on what's happening in the cannabis lending space at the moment. Um, can you maybe give it everybody an overview of uh, the Polaris Fund that you've set up to deal specifically with the cannabis industry? Sure. So Polaris Equity Group was the first U.S.-based domestic lender in the country. Um, we uh, entered the space in about 2016. And since that time, we've done about 69 deals for about $430 million. And um, we're taking that lending platform and we're starting our initial um, due diligence to look at the European market um, in other markets to bring that same lending platform to provide debt to uh, cannabis use property owners across uh, across the country and, and basically now in, in Europe and some other countries as well. Okay, incredible. So basically bringing a state of finance to the European industry as well. Can you uh, maybe, I was reading about your Java's 11.8 million round of funding that you recently did. What are the metrics you look for in a good uh, investment opportunity? What are the top two things that you at the Polaris Fund would look for? Great. So regardless of what country that we're lending in, we're always going to look for a, a, a very experienced cannabis operator um, who may or may not be the owner of the building. Um, typically, they are what we call an a owner user. Um, the next most important thing is we want a, a strong sponsor to support that transaction. Um, most of the transactions that we do our uh, value add, meaning that we are providing the capital to acquire and build the facility as a bridge loan. And then from there, they're going to refinance that loan with a lower cost lender once it's fully built. And in that model, we need an extremely strong sponsor that has the personal balance sheet, uh, income and credit to support the size of the loan that they're borrowing. So if it's somebody that's trying to borrow, you know, like that $11.8 million transaction, we need to have somebody that can support that, whether it's an individual or a corporate guarantee um, to, to do that transaction. So the other thing is, is that we require a commercial piece of real estate, meaning that we'll do commercial buildings and or uh, greenhouses, but no agricultural deals. So um, sometimes there is land tied up with the commercial buildings, but we're giving our value to the buildings, not to the land. Okay, amazing. And you guys have seen, I see you're at the ICBC in Berlin next week. Um, are you seeing Germany as the kind of first step into Europe for you guys? Or have you been in discussions in Malta or Denmark or other territories in this side of the world? It's so preliminary right now. And we just returned from the ICBC in uh, London uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what we're trying to get comfortable with is how does any of the European market work if you can import from other countries that don't have to go through the the same ultra high building compliance and employee expenses and electric expenses and all the other expenses that are so high in these in, in the European Union, let's just say, and you can have countries that are able to import. We're trying to get our arms wrapped around how this is going to work um, for those uh, for these countries if they're going to build their own facilities within their own country or within the European Union. So this is the first thing that we're trying to really get our arms wrapped around to make us feel comfortable if we're going to do any lending in um, the European Union or in Europe if you can import at a lower cost. Yeah, what I think what will happen over in Europe, you're obviously going to have the low cost import options that are going to be available, but we're renowned for farming over here. And I see genetics and different strains being created in each different country over here that's going to be unique to this part of the world. That'll almost be like wine to a degree that special, special farmers are going to be able to create specific genetics that make their industry that little bit better. And I think we're just a couple of years away from that. You see Germany, obviously, at the moment, it's now a race to who can get the cheapest flour in, like it kind of does in, in a lot of the industries. But I think you're going to start to see once the, the agriculture and farming grants or uh, bodies allow this, you'll start to see a huge amount of talent flow into this industry then. Yeah, we're, we're anxious to see that. Um, I had the same... Uh, I had the same thought process as you comparing California markets, which has the brand name and the, the strains um, and for the rest of the country and thinking that 
those those other states across the country um, would not be able to compete with strains and things like that. And I've had to evolve that that thinking process after I've uh, toured many facilities that are in emerging states that now already have uh, the caliber and quality of, of high high end product that would compete easily head to head with California. And so we have to understand: is this going to happen here in uh, the you know the European Union? And so we have to think about, okay, how long does it take to start the importation process um, when you're importing into Germany or wherever it might be from the day that paperwork is submitted until that product lands um, in the European Union? Is that product going to be able to compete directly with something that is uh, grown domestically within the European Union? So these are the things I'm, I'm trying to, to learn myself about. While we'll, be, uh, while we'll be there and we'll be touring some facilities and, and looking at what's happening there and trying to understand the pros and cons of what might happen. And when legislation is still not decided, it's, it's difficult to start making big, uh, you know, making bets and, and, and trying to see how it's going to go. Um, in the United States, uh, it, nothing has really happened for quite some time since, since our, the most consequential uh, legislation passed there, which was the Rohrabacher Blumenauer Amendment that defunded our Department of Justice for prosecution and the Hemp Act, which doesn't really apply exactly to what we're doing. Yeah, no, I think you said at the start of the show as well, operators are one of the things that you look for in an investment. I think that's going to be the case over here. Realistically, California has got amazing flower due to the climate. Colombia and, and some of the South American territories and Portugal to a degree can compete with that. But uh, if you understand HVAC systems, environmental control systems, you really just need an amazing operator. And uh, I think you're going to be able to compete because realistically, when you're when you're comparing 24% THC to 26% THC, the consumer doesn't really know that. They understand the, the flavonoids and the terpenes and the flavors and smells that they're going to get out of the plant and what it's going to look like compared to the strength, I think. Yeah, um, we agree. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a process for the consumers. Um, typically, as new markets emerge, they're willing to take uh, inferior products because they're available. Um, and what's interesting about that is that typically the illegal products are superior in quality. So eventually, hopefully, those um, th those legal products will get to the same quality that, that the uh, domestic com consumers are going to appreciate and look for those premium high end brands that uh, make sense to grow them domestically. Yeah, another market I'm looking forward to seeing is New York come on board in September now. And so, some of the genetics that the hipsters in Brooklyn are going to be producing, I think, is going to be pretty amazing. Yeah, um, you know, each of these genetics are, um, it's one thing to have one that's an am amazing brand, but you have to have it to be a consistent genetic that can continually reproduce. And, and that's, there's more to it than just having a, a one-off product that you can say, look at this, this, this amazing strain. If you to produce that consistently is a, uh, a challenge that every brand is going, goes through to, to, to make sure that they have a consistent quality of product at all times. Yeah. And that's why you see Denmark are probably the leaders in Europe at the moment when it comes to cannabis flower, just from their ornamental flower industry and the fact that they have government backing in finance as well. I'm going to just jump on to the next topic uh, before I let you go. And it's how to value a cannabis company. Now, everybody's kind of seen the Canadian nightmare that's happened over the past six to seven years with the billions of dollars that have been wasted. What are the core metrics for evaluating a cannabis company? Let's say that's a year in business. Is it, as, does it have to have IP? Is it an IPTA rating? Is it what is the, the core metrics for a man of your level? Sure. So us, um, unfortunately, it's a case by case scenario for every transaction that we're looking at. But the first part for us is that we're not valuing, per se, the, the value of the company. Um, for the cannabis operator. That's not our job because we're not utilizing the cannabis company or the enterprise value of the cannabis company as our lending basis. We're purely evaluating the cannabis operator on their level of experience. And typically that might shake out in their performance of how they've done thus far, um, but it not, not always necessarily. We want to see that that cannabis operator has the experience and capability to, to they don't, they're not trying to learn how to cultivate already. They've already figured that part out. And so for us, when we're looking at a facility, we're looking at, we establish our lending basis off of the value of the facility, the tenant improvements and the equipment that are going into that facility. So for us, it's a lot more 
easy to extrapolate what the value is because we're only lending off of the real estate basis and not off the enterprise value of the company. Okay, so pretty much anybody in the manufacturing edibles can fit into this category because the equipment and the, the property they're going to have is going to be uh, of value, same way as pre-roll machines and facilities. So you kind of uh, fit into every facet or facet of the industry. Yeah, most of the time people are going to come to us for larger builds is what's happened in the, the, our domestic program. Um, and, uh, you know, being that cannabis is going to be is legal in each of these states federally, the banks will be able to lend there. And so when you have a smaller facility that's that's extraction or something like that, the bank, you might be able to get a traditional loan on that. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out too. But typically the banks are not going to value these properties um, the same way you would a commercial, typical commercial facility. And so that's usually where we become a lending advantage. We're, we understand the cannabis market. We understand how to build these. We understand how to process the draws. We've got all that infrastructure in place. And We've competed in the in the U.S. against banks for 30 years, and it's it's there's no way they can compete with us on a uh, value add or construction type loan. Once that facility is is fully stabilized, meaning that's cash flowing on its own, then you can start looking to uh, traditional banks to refinance that debt. Okay, amazing. It's a wealth of information. I know you're a very busy man, so I won't take up too much more of your time. I look forward to seeing you at ICBC in Berlin, and thank you very much for taking your time today, Rob. You bet. Thank you. Bye. Until next time, episode B.